All right, and we are back again, continuing our another day, another bailout theme from the Federal Reserve, the helicopter paper fiat currency dollar or digital dollar drop. The Fed announced earlier today that they will now be buying short-term municipal bonds. These are municipalities in the most trouble because local businesses, no cash flow from the local businesses, revenues collapse at the local businesses, which means that the municipalities are not going to get the tax revenues. This is in spite of dozens and dozens of financial professionals that I saw on financial Twitter over the last week or so who were repeating that the Federal Reserve is out of ammo. In fact, today, I think I saw at least a couple tweets from a people I, res I respect who are claiming the Fed is out of ammo. Please, please, please go back and reread the Ben Bernanke helicopter money speech from 2002. Either read it for the first time or reread it. The Fed is not out of ammo. And I think there's multiple reasons for why the Fed is doing what it is doing. So number one, cash flows, tax revenue, cash flows from businesses, revenues from businesses collapsed. That means that tax revenues that governments were counting on have collapsed. Asset prices have collapsed. That means capital gains taxes, unless you're short, that the federal government was counting on have collapsed. So the Fed is going to have to cover the difference. Okay, the Fed is not out of ammo. The other major reason I think the Fed is doing this, and I don't think the Fed will ever admit this publicly, but in my opinion, the Fed is doing this to try to weaken the dollar. So what the Fed is actually doing, and this goes back to my dollar tug of war thesis, but I, I really think the Fed wants to weaken the dollar. The dollar index, if you have not looked at the chart, the dollar index really, let's see here in the chart. So March 6th, it was at 96, and then it collapsed down below 95, and you had all the dollar bears saying that that was it, the dollar was going to collapse, that was it, that was endgame. So by, I think, March 9th, it got below 95 on the dollar index, the chart here, it fell off a cliff a couple days before that, and then unbelievably, since March 9th, it's been an escalator, a very steep escalator up since March 9th. And here we are on the dollar index. We are above 100. We were above 102, I think, in the last couple days. It has not held 102 much. And I think, in my humble opinion, that is because the Trump administration, President Trump, the U.S. Treasury, and the Federal Reserve do not want the dollar index going higher. This is all because of the dollar tug of war. So the people who are like, the dollar rally is going to continue even more. The Fed's going to continue announcing new asset purchase programs. Number one, because they have to, because the tax revenues, the asset prices have collapsed. So less capital gains tax revenues and less tax revenues for the municipalities and states because people are not doing business anymore. Well, not really. The amount of business that people are doing has collapsed. So the Fed is going to have to fill the gap that's why they're announcing it's going to be a temporary purchase for short-term municipal bonds. But if you're familiar with the Milton Friedman quote, there is nothing as permanent as a temporary government program. That's what Milton Friedman said. One of the few things I actually agree with him on because um, a lot of his economics was not very good. Okay, so let me just talk about the article here. The Federal Reserve said Friday it would extend its asset purchase program into short-term municipal bonds. This, let me just give a little anecdote here. So I was listening to Danielle DiMartino Booth talk about um, municipal bonds in the last month or two on one of her interviews. I can't remember exactly which one because I've watched a lot of her interviews. There's a lot of people that don't like her, but you get a lot of juicy tidbits about the bond market from her, about her time working at the Dallas Federal Reserve for years. And this juicy little tidbit that you got from Danielle DiMartino Booth, and she worked directly under um, Dallas Federal Reserve Bank President Richard Fisher, who actually, I think, voted once against one of the QE programs. And Ben Bernanke, he was on Ben Bernanke's shit list for a very, very long time. He was one of the more, let's just say, rational-headed Federal Reserve Bank presidents because he was not a PhD economist. He was a businessman. He was a Wall Street guy. And he understood that printing money would eventually lead to destroying the dollar and pitchforks and torches in the streets 
And, you know, in 2008, we'd occupy Wall Street. In the future, with congressmen doing insider stock trading and dumping after dumping all their shares two months ago, after they got secret briefings, after they got um, security clearance level briefings about how bad the global pandemic was, you know, people on the streets are going to be very, very upset because now their retirement accounts are in the hole. Just a total mess. So what Danielle DiMartino Booth said about municipal bonds was the Federal Reserve actually discussed buying it in 2008 and 2009, but it was only a discussion. And in the discussions, they said, we can't do it. It could collapse the dollar. It would make us look desperate. It would, you know, make things look much, much worse than even they really were in 2008-9. If they started buying municipal bonds, they were worried very, very seriously about an even worse inflation problem and the dollar falling too quickly. So they wouldn't even buy, my point was, they wouldn't even buy municipal bonds, according to Danielle DiMartino Booth, who heard this story from Richard Fisher and was in, uh, involved in the discussions. I'm not sure what her security clearance was at the Federal Reserve, because they do have security clearance, but they would not be discussed buying municipal bonds in 2008-9, but this just shows you how bad things really are now compared to 2008 and 9. And yes, asset prices are not down to 2008-9 levels, but that's because, as I said last night, a lot more money has been printed, and the bailout programs that took a long time to get rolled out in 2008 and 9 were dusted off and rolled out very, very quickly in just the last two weeks. That is the big, big difference, is all these bailout programs that were in place from like 2008 to 2010 or 11, and then they were, you know, phased out, or the Fed claims they were phased out. I mean, do we really know if they were phased out? I've heard for years now that there were still currency swaps with the European Central Bank. I had a really good source tell me this straight up, that 2014 in an IMF meeting, that the Federal Reserve was putting enormous amounts of currency swaps into the European Central Bank, helping the European banks then, so they didn't collapse then. That was someone directly in an IMF meeting who was telling me this stuff back then. I don't know the amount of currency swaps that was, but it sounded massive because supposedly the phrase currency swap was used hundreds of times in presentations in 2014 at an IMF meeting here in D.C. by members of central banks, members of treasury departments. You get the gist of it. Something else that's interesting that I wanted to bring up before I forget here is I was looking at how much treasuries the Federal Reserve on their official balance sheet they own, and it's well over $400 billion more in treasuries now since the end of August 2019. So we don't have, here's, here's the interesting thing, we have not gotten any official balance sheet updates from the Federal Reserve for this week. I'm suspecting that we could have like a $200, $300 billion jump in a week or two in a very short order. I don't know if it's next week, the week after, but one of these days we're going to check the website if they're actually still going to update it and be honest, well, be quote unquote honest with us anymore about an official balance sheet update. Maybe that was it. Maybe March 12th was the last official balance sheet update and that's it. We're not getting it anymore, folks. Maybe that's it. Because if you're familiar with the data on the Fed's official uh, St. Louis Fed's website, they've been discontinuing a lot of the stuff lately starting in January. So they discontinued the trade weighted dollar index. They discontinued how many mortgage-backed securities they own a while ago. So maybe we're not going to get any more of this information, and the Fed's just going to, I don't know, keep it totally in the dark. Or they're only going to release it out in public in absolutely necessary. So for the Fed to, the Fed is definitely trying to weaken the dollar. Okay, my, th my thesis is the Fed is definitely trying to weaken the dollar. They realize that globally, this dollar tug of war, there is an enormous dollar shortage outside the United States. Debt is defaulting massively. Remember on yesterday's show, I talked about some of the sources I've spoken to inside credit ratings agencies that have given me some information over the last couple of weeks, and then an investment banking source that was basically the credit markets and the bond markets. The corporate bond markets, the high-yield bond markets, commercial paper, money markets, they all broke in the last two weeks. Um, we got another article out today by a Bank of America credit strategist confirming this. So Bank of America says the bond market is broken and only the Fed buying bonds can fix it. And they're, they're not really just going to, they're not going to fix it. Come on. 
they're just going to paper over it. So these stuffy suits on Wall Street, wearing expensive suits, expensive shirts, expensive shoes, can pretend that the economy is functioning normally again, and that there's fundamental justifications for why their asset prices should go up so they can sell it to suckers instead of just, oh, the central banks exp all expanded their balance sheet by, I don't know, with the press releases, let's say ballpark the last two or three weeks, $10 trillion? George Gammon said more. Okay, so all those commitments with the trillion dollar repo, now now the um, the hedge funds and the primary dealers are not they're not always borrowing a trillion dollars every single day, but the fact that there is the amount there if they need it shows how bad the system is. Okay, we had we had a total system failure because everything is even worse, more debt, more credit, corporate bond pro um, problems with corporations, and the next shoe to drop is credit ratings downgrades. That is the big. Every everyone I've talked to, financial professionals at the ratings agencies, at the um, professional bond fund managers that have like given me some information secondhand through friends, the stuff that that um, bond traders, professional bond traders are posting on Twitter, um, that Jeff Gunlock is posting on Twitter, they're all worried. The next major shoe to drop that's coming because revenues for a lot of these corporations have collapsed, because cash flows have collapsed. So there's no free cash flow there, or very little, unless you're like Costco or Clorox or um, the company that's making Charmin Ultra Soft or Charmin, um, you know, Charmin toilet paper. By the way, do you guys remember my longtime podcast listeners and my Patreon account contributors? Do you remember about six to eight months ago, I was getting all these super chat questions in there and uh, questions in the live chat and people are like, Jason, I don't have money to buy physical gold or silver. What should I do? in case there's an emergency. This was around repo, when repo was just starting to get. And you know, now in hindsight, we can say that those large hedge funds were crippled in September when repo madness started and they limped along for another six months before they got a kill shot. So the kill shot was in the last two weeks, but those guys were dead for six months and just limping along, pretending to still be alive. They were zombie hedge funds that were unhedged, that were over leveraged, that made bad bets. That should be in prison. Some of these guys should be in prison. Corporate CEOs, hedge fund managers, if they cause that much fraud. Anyways, uh, toilet paper. There was a question about like, what should you do if you can't afford physical gold or silver? And I was like, six, this was six to eight months ago. And I was like, well, not a bad idea. And some people were making fun of me for this. I was like, well, maybe you should just, whenever you go to Target or Walmart, whenever you go to the grocery store, maybe just buy an extra package of Charmin, because it's the higher quality toilet paper, the premium, you never know. And six months, eight months later, if you have like an extra one per month, you know, now in this scenario, I bet you wish you did that, right? That's almost worth its weight in gold or silver. Almost. Instead of a uh, copper, a uh, Charmin, like a nice package of Charmin is the poor man's uh, silver. The even poor man's silver. I don't know. the Something like that. I'm just, if you, if you actually did do it, I'm just joking, okay? I'm going to get I'm gonna get emails now saying, how dare you say this? It's, it's a joke. So, okay, um, if you're not familiar with my dollar tug-of-war thesis, it is in the archives. First week of January 2020, I made like a six-minute audio podcast explaining things. So right now, we have a very two very powerful forces pulling on the dollar. And I said this would be the most important thing in 2020, and in a lot of ways it is. So we have the government that does not want a strong dollar. We have the Federal Reserve, we have President Trump, we have the Trump administration, we have the U.S. Treasury. They all want to weaken the dollar. Okay, they're trying any way they can. Any new bailout program, commercial paper, money markets, Buying municipal bonds. I don't know what they're going to do next. Oh, the, uh, MMTQE. They're even. They're even gonna. They're even gonna start juicing the um, Community Reinvestment Act. They're going to do all types of crazy things to try to get um, the dollar weaker. Well, be careful what you wish for, because we, the economy is not producing a lot of the same amounts of goods and services. There's going to be more fiat if you give everyone two thousand dollars. And the economy is not producing the same amount of Lysol wipes, Clorox wipes, uh, toilet paper. 
you're, you could see those prices skyrocket. You can see stat really bad stagflation in some consumer prices. You're already seeing rationing at some grocery stores and elsewhere and rationing for quality, the premium toilet paper and, and premium paper towels. Now, this may change, maybe six months, maybe a year from now. Hopefully, things are back to normal production-wise. But, you know, if that doesn't change, if the global pandemic gets worse, things are going to get really crazy. So, back to the dollar tug of war. On one side, you have the government that does not want a strong currency. You have the central bank, all the academic economists that have been wrong all the time. They all want a weak currency. But you have the dollar rapidly rising. And the reason is because all of this debt, this corporate, these corporate bonds um, outside the United States, th these dollar bonds, all the revenue, all the cash flow that these companies were counting on when the global economy was functioning normally, all those revenue projections. And a lot of these companies, um, what their chief financial officer and the senior executives do is they borrow debt like crazy, and it's all based on steady cash flow projections. Well, guess what? The cash flow, the revenues, and the steady cash flow projections, they're gone. But the debt is still there. So the defaults, they need dollars because they're worried about defaulting, and they're worried about going bankrupt now. So that's the other side of the dollar tug of war. So you have a lot of demand for dollars. I've seen Zero Hedge talk about a $12 trillion margin call on the other side of the uh, U.S. government, Federal Reserve, President Trump, U.S. Treasury trying to weaken the dollar. The other side is not $12 trillion. It is $24 trillion and counting. It is much larger than that because there's all these derivatives on the other side too that could collapse those um, governments, it could collapse foreign banks, it could collapse um, foreign private banks, and it could collapse uh, private foreign corporations. So you, that's what's creating the demand for dollars. That is one of the major reasons why the Federal Reserve is issuing all these currency swaps to all these different countries that are trading partners of the U.S. other than China. Even though China probably needs the dollars, I would say as much or more than anyone else. So this dollar tug of war is going to keep going on. The Federal Reserve, the Treasury, President Trump, the Trump administration are going to get even more pissed that they cannot get the dollar down. They want it down. They want a managed decline of the dollar, but they can't get it down. It's going up. Because on the other side, you have all these entities that need dollars immediately or they default and go bankrupt immediately. And I am dollar neutral, okay? At some point, the Federal Reserve is going to win. The Federal Reserve can keep changing the rules. The Federal Reserve can keep giving us larger and larger checks. The stuff that is being proposed with the MMT stimulus QE stuff and now Community Reinvestment Act getting juiced again is insane. And they're not done. There's a lot more proposals that can come. We're at theater of the absurd here. That is how crazy everything's getting. If you think things can't get worse, let's check back in a couple months. Okay, this is, here we are, what, two weeks in to the next global financial crisis, and we are, for the last 10 days, we are getting a basically a new bailout or stimulus package proposal. It's basically every day now, and they're not done. Because they know, if you look at the stock market, the Trump has given back all of his gains from the Trump administration if the Dow hits sixteen hundred, if the Dow gets down to sixteen thousand, so the Dow's probably going to test sixteen thousand support levels. Um, I have charts in my Patreon account for uh, the S and P five hundred extensive technical analysis for the S and P five hundred and the Dow. They're there for my over five hundred, almost six hundred, I think now Patreon account contributors, and you can take a look there. But it looks to me in the next couple weeks, the Dow, uh, unless the Fed figures out the right formula of dollar devaluation and uh, MMT stimulus, MMT QE stimulus packages to get people to spend online shopping or grocery store shopping from their homes. The Dow's heading down to 16,000. And if the Dow breaks 16,000, Katie bar the door. If the Dow breaks those 16,000, 16,200 support levels, we're getting, we're getting back, we're heading pretty quickly back down to 2008, 2009 levels, maybe even lower. They're, they're well aware of this. The plunge protection team, the treasury, they're well aware of this. 
now that the Dow is uh, capital gains on the stock market are below, they've given back all the Trump level gains. There are, I would say, very little, if any, or no capital gains tax revenues now in stocks. So a lot of those stock market capital gains are gone, which this is a vicious cycle. George Gammon and myself have talked about this. Now there's potentially hundreds of billions of dollars more of a hole in the Treasury's budget. And the Treasury's budget, I mean, let's be honest, the real economy is a mess. The global supply chain is a mess. The global pandemic has done unbelievable amounts of damage to most businesses and most stores, unless you're Costco or Walmart or Clorox or the toilet paper manufacturers. I mean, most businesses are absolutely destroyed. It's going to take a year or two minimum to get things back to even a little bit levels. That's how bad things are. And that's why you're, you're seeing the metals prices collapse. Copper prices collapse. I have a nice chart of that and some other analysis behind my Patreon account wall. The silver miners are in big trouble. If oil prices were higher, the silver miners would be looking at bankruptcy probably in a couple months. Maybe they can buy a little bit more time because oil prices are lower. Maybe I'll do... Um, I'm I'm been a little bit busy this week because I, I have to help out my parents with a ton of errands. They don't really want to leave the house, so I've had to do a lot of stuff for them for the last like three or four days. Hours of stuff. Buying groceries, uh, you know, uh, five gallon jugs of water, um, you know, driving places to find them stuff. But uh, hopefully I will be able to get around to doing um, some more analysis of the silver miners in an audio podcast just for my Patreon account contributors. Maybe a written article. We'll see. So those of you who are wondering, who are sending me messages why I haven't done one, I've been really, really busy because both of my parents are paralyzed with fear and don't want to really leave the house anymore. And we're drastically underprepared, even though I've been warning them for two months how bad things really were with the global pandemic. Okay, I got a few super chats here. I think I covered pretty much everything. So the dollar tug of war is going to keep going on. I think eventually the Federal Reserve, um, the Treasury, Trump administration, President Trump will find the right formula and there will be worse stagflation, especially because the global economy is not functioning normally. So uncertain consumer goods and other important items to survive, there will be higher and higher prices because the global economy is not producing even normal levels of many different uh, goods and services, especially a lot of consumer items. Although I am hearing that the toilet, pa toilet paper factories are running 24-7, 365. That's what I've heard. You know, li if you work at Lysol, if you listen to this podcast and you work at Lysol, I'm calling you out. I've sent you three or four emails on your corporate website and you don't even have the decency to email me back over the last week or two. So if there are any anyone who works at Lysol, in the corporate headquarters or friends who know people who work at Lysol, you guys need to get on point. Same thing with the Clorox wipes people. It is you guys are really sucking right now. Absolutely horrible. You guys should be minting money right now. Lysol wipes, Clorox wipes, you guys should be minting money, the cleaning products companies. And instead we've had how many? The shortages are nuts. The shortages of cleaning products are insane. Okay, okay, end of rant there. Again, if, if anyone listening to this podcast either works at Lysol or the parent company or is friends or Clorox or is friends with someone who does, please tell them that the production needs to increase. I do not know why they're two months behind on this. It is ridiculous. We know why we don't have N95 masks. It's really simple why we don't have N95 masks because Chinese gov the Chinese government confiscated almost all of them. Now, 3M and the other companies that manufacture them in China got paid for them, but the Chinese government basically has confiscated all the N95 masks produced for the last three or so months. Dirty little secret. Most people aren't aware of it. And a lot of the other governments are 100% aware of this. They've known for this. They've known this a long time. And they are too 
freaking scared to publicly criticize the Chinese government for doing it. Also, a lot of them are getting money from the Chinese government, especially the smaller ones. So, the Chinese government got most of the mass, and the rest of us got screwed. Okay, let me take a look at the another another rant there. That's over. Over and out. Let me look at the super chat questions, and uh, then I'll wrap this up. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a water break. I've been talking for quite a few minutes here. Okay, Greg sent me the super chat. Thank you, Jason. Keep up the good work. You're welcome, Greg, and thank you for sending me super chats. By the way, Greg, are you a Patreon account contributor? Because if you're going to keep sending me $20 super chats and YouTube's going to um, YouTube's going to take like 50% of that, um, I would get more of it and you would get good content if you signed up for my Patreon. So just something to think about. If you're going to chip in 20 bucks every one or two uh, one or two live stream shows, you get more value if you signed up on my Patreon. There is a lot of content beyond the paywall. There is audio podcasts. There is uh, written articles. There is technical analysis with charts. If you trade, there's hedging strategies discuss. There's a lot of stuff beyond the paywall. Although the last couple days I've been so busy trying to help out my parents, you know, I haven't done as much, but hopefully I won't have to do that um, every day. Okay, let me look for more super chats. Let's see here. Okay, JB Weld, thank you for the five dollars. What's your strategy in all this? Any hedges against inflation you're taking? Um, so I practice what I preach. I was stockpiling um Charmin. <laughs> so I was um over the for a year now. I've been buying extra Charmin. So I do have extra toilet paper. Um, I did. I am a little bit of a clean freak, so I did have extra hand sanitizer. I have um, many many months worth of hand sanitizer stockpiled. I had that. So I had some things. I do have quite a few Lysol wipes, only a couple, but I'm rationing the Lysol wipes. I know I'm going to get emails and comments about that laughing. So I do have a couple canisters of Lysol wipes, but um, they were bought before everything went crazy two or three weeks ago and the shelves disappeared. And I can't get any more Lysol wipes right now. I mean, I've looked at 20 different online e-commerce websites. I've tried all kinds of stuff. I've um, made a bunch of phone calls. I can't find them. I don't even know if they're producing them anymore. Target has pulled them from the website. Um, I did actually have a successful couple cases of Lysol wipes orders. I think I ordered like a couple, three, three or four packs from Walmart and the order went through and it said my order was going to ship. And then four or five days later after the order went through, they canceled my order and said they didn't have a date for when the order was going to ship. And that was it. Okay, Greg's on the Patreon. Okay, good. Good, making sure. Um, What other hedging stuff? Let's see here. What's your strategy in all this? Any hedges against inflation I'm taking? Well, it's kind of late, JB Weld. It's kind of late to stockpile a lot of these consumer goods now. That's the problem. So these, the consumer goods you could have stockpiled, it was easier six to eight months ago. So you could have stockpiled hand sanitizers. You could have stockpiled um, antibacterial soap back then, some of it, and toilet, toilet paper. I thought uh, I nailed toilet paper. People were making fun of me that I was a Charmin chill about six to eight months ago. People were really laughing about it. Imagine if you had like an extra room in your house full of Charmin right now. Could be negotiating on Craigslist. Meeting people in person, getting a bunch of cash. It's worth its weight in silver right now. Yeah, I mean, it's hedges against inflation. Um, there are gold stocks that are really, really cheap right now for hedges against inflation. The silver stocks, in my opinion, are in... Some of them are in big, big trouble. If silver goes too much lower, some of these silver miners are going to have to put mines on care and maintenance. They're going to be some of these silver miners are going to be running the mines at you know three, four, five dollar an ounce loss 
per ounce losses. Some of these silver miners, they're going to be just hemorrhaging cash. There's no capital available for a lot of these silver miners. You know, even when silver was at 18, like two months ago, $18 an ounce, the silver miners were improving their balance sheet. They had better margins. They were paying off debt, but there was not a lot of capital on the capital markets for them to go raise, um, for them to go raise to fix their balance sheets. There was very few miners when metals prices were higher two months ago that could have, um, some of the gold miners did, but the silver miners, there wasn't that capital to go raise like a hundred million or more. So you can imagine now with metals prices, especially silver's gotten creamed, their industrial component. Listen to the interview with uh, Lawrence Lepard that I just released a couple hours ago. The industrial component for silver, or at least a lot of people expect it to, and that's it's trading as if the industrial, industrial demand for silver is totally collapsed. That might not be true. I have not looked at any research reports yet, but that's certainly the price action, is if all the industrial demand for silver has collapsed. Now, the investment demand is exploding. It's skyrocketing higher, and eventually the disparity will create a rally in silver, especially if miners go bankrupt or shut down mines. Another super chat here. So it's, it's tough to hedge a lot of inflation now. There are gold stocks that are doing very, very well still. Oil prices falling means the Q1 2020 margins for gold stocks are going to be good. Do not buy all of your gold stock positions at once. I've been seeing this a lot lately. We don't know how much lower everything's going to go. We don't know the crazy things the Fed and the other central banks are going to do. If things get bad enough, I could see the Fed maybe considering devaluing against gold. It depends how many other things they try. I've called that the nuclear option. That'll be safe for last. But we are definitely in a crisis period. The asset prices are way higher than what I was told has been going on behind the scenes for the last two weeks. And that's why you have Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen saying that the, the laws need to be changed immediately so the Fed can buy corporate bonds. Okay, they know what's going on behind the scenes. Joe asks, this is a good super chat question, any sovereign debt downgrades on the horizon? Are ratings agencies too scared or corrupt to downgrade U.S. government debt no matter what happens? Um, I think Kyle Bass is probably going to be right and the dollar will be saved for last because of the dollar tug of war that's going on and how much dollar denominated debt. So the currency, uh, my buddy Brent Johnson at San Diego Capital Dollar Milkshake and the currency swaps that are outstanding are actually, and the there's been, have you guys noticed this? There's actually been two currency swap press releases since uh, Sunday night. So there's been two, there's been multiple currency swap lines. That's how bad things are. Okay, so the Fed has had to put out two currency swap press releases. So there's multiple swap lines out with some of these governments and some of these, um, uh, the banking system. Um, Joe, I think the worst problem from what I heard right now is with corporate bonds. But the sovereign debt is going to be impacted by that because that means less tax revenues going into governments. So if the corporations and the small business owners, the small medium-sized business owners and the entrepreneurs who um, grow, are growing their business are not making money, they're not paying tax revenues. So I think what the people in power realize is the corporate bonds are going to be the downgrades, the credit ratings downgrades are going to occur, and the corporate bonds could are going to be drastically lower in price or default full defaults. And that's the most short-term need. And that's because we had all these hedge funds drastically over-leverage 10x or more and do leverage bond trades in the corporate bond market, in junk bonds, in, cor in investment-grade corporate debt, Debt that was drastically overrated, that is not investment grade. Got another super chat from JB. The world a year from now will look nothing like the world we once knew. The cr this crisis hasn't yet set into the minds of Americans. Yeah, um, Lawrence Lepard said uh, he thinks things will be fine in, uh, be a lot better in six months. I'm not so sure. Yeah, I think it might take 12 to 18, but we'll see.
Got another super chat from Mickey. He says the Aussie dollar is going to get crushed by printing. They, they're all doing it. They're all doing it. All, all these gov the Australian Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia did a lot of it in the last couple weeks. It's a race to the bottom now. I don't think they care anymore. They're just so worried about debt default and how their um, tax revenues have collapsed. They're so worried about deflation and asset prices falling and their tax revenues collapsing. They're trying to devalue their currency so much. Yeah, so the time to prepare for inflation hedges, I mean, maybe you can buy some meat and you can freeze it, or you can buy a food dehydrator, a vacuum sealer or food dehydrator, learn to, uh, I don't know, prep like that. It's a bunch of different machines if you learn how to cook. Look, here, here's the main thing. Everyone here in the United States, we're going to have a lot of free time. That means if you have a lot of free time, the government's going to send you checks Use that instead of watching TV or watching Netflix all the time or what else you're doing. I don't I don't even want to think about a lot of that stuff. You could learn a new skill. You can read some books. You can watch some YouTube videos. You can buy some audio books. You can um, sign up for Masterclass or Skillshare or you can watch YouTube videos or podcasts. Go and learn a skill you wanted to learn and figure out, figure out how to make money online now. There's still going to be people making some money now. I, my my little tiny little small business here the last three or four months has grown a lot. It's shocking to me how much it's grown. Earlier today, I had an email from one guy. He was like, he was like, um, with everything collapsing here, he was like, I have to cancel my Patreon for six months. He's like, I love your content, but um, I have to cut my expenses. He's like, I'm really sorry. I was like, okay, I understand. Everyone has tough choices now. The situation's a freaking mess. Everyone has a, well. If you're here in the United States and you, and you're not at your job or you're not working from home, you have a lot of free time. Be entrepreneurial. Come up with a side hustle to make some money on a on an online business. Or add a skill so a year or two from now, when we start doing normal economic activities, you can hit the ground running. Most Americans won't will not heed that advice. People quit when the going gets tough. A lot of, a lot of Americans are not mentally prepared to deal with what's happening right now. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of different people um, before uh, they closed down the restaurants to sit down and eat, and I was having discussions with people at stores that I was going to and restaurants, and a lot of people are not mentally prepared to deal with what's happening right now. It's sad. Okay, well, that's it for tonight's show. I want to thank everyone for listening, and thank you very much to my over 500, almost 600 now, Patreon account contributors. It is growing so rapidly. My hard work is finally paying off. Shockingly, it's actually growing while um, you know things are getting worse. I can't believe it. Um, and thank you very much to my, uh, I think it's under 10 now, monthly PayPal contributors. I also take some crypto donations. I will hold a lit. I don't even check the account that often. So even though crypto prices are falling, if you want to tip a little, a fraction of a Bitcoin, I have gotten a half a Bitcoin in the past. I'm not, that was the largest tip I've ever gotten. If you want to tip that, you know, I'll thank you publicly. No, well, well, actually most of the people don't want to be thanked publicly. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a contrarian. Things that are crashing do interest me somewhat, unless the company's bankrupt with a lot of debt. I'm not buying crypto right now, but that is crazy. Maybe I'll do another show on that. How much crypto is... I mean, almost everything's crashing right now because the markets don't like um, uncertainty. And it could be at least, you know, 12 months before we get back to even somewhat normal economic activity again. 